Good evening, colleagues. Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name's Alison Donnell and I'm the Head of School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing here at UEA. So thank you all for joining us for our final inaugural lecture of the autumn term. It's great to be here in person this evening, although welcome to all of you who are also joining us on YouTube. We're very grateful for your presence too and hopefully we'll be engaging you later. So um, please do let us know in the chat where you're watching from and we'll take a recording of that so David knows everybody who's, who's been present tonight. Um, obviously, I would like to welcome our speaker for this evening, Professor David Noel-Smith. David arrived at UEA in 2012 after four years teaching at the Université Paris Diderot. Since then, he has published three monographs, Sounding, Stroke, Silence, Martin Heidegger at the Limits of Poetics in 2013, On Voice in Poetry in 2015, and W.S. Graham, The Poem as Art Objects, this year, 2022. David's work on W.S. Graham has also furnished a special issue of the Chicago Review in 2018, and two exhibitions to mark Graham's centenary. The first, Voice and Vision, The Poetry and Art of W.S. Graham, was displayed at Pia Art Centre in Stromness, Orkney. The second, an installation at the Poetry Library in London, was entitled Constructing Spaces, named after Graham's renowned poem, The Constructed Space. Renowned thanks to David's work, of course. During this time, he's also co-edited Modernist Legacies, Trends and Fault Lines in British Poetry today with Abigail Lang in 2015, and published more than 30 chapters and articles on topics ranging from art theory to privacy studies to contemporary poetry. The central theme of his work, however, has always been an elucidation of the fundamental concept of poetics. During his time at UEA, David has collaborated with colleagues, both as a researcher and an editor and as a teacher. He is currently part of the editorial team for English, the Journal of, Engl of the English Association, which is housed in the School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing here at UEA. And in this capacity, he works closely with his colleagues, Nonia Williams, Jeremy Noel Todd and Tiffany Atkinson. David's also co-devised modules with colleagues in philosophy, politics and American studies, as well as working with numerous colleagues in, in LDC. In the acknowledgements to his most recent book, David recognised generously how indebted his work was to the conversations and debates that he's had with colleagues and students over the last 10 years, and how the intellectual environment here has shaped his thinking, teaching and writing, and continues to do so. His latest project is to write an introduction to close reading poetry called Making Sense of Poems, and tonight's inaugural lecture comes out of the early work for that project. So please join me now in welcoming Professor David Noel-Smith to give his inaugural lecture. Um, thank you, thank you everyone for coming. Um, and thanks especially to Alison for that kind introduction, but also for her support over the last five years. As lots of colleagues and students here know, Alison is stepping down as our head of school um, next month. I guess the best Christmas present a head of school can ask for is to have someone relieve them of the burden. Um, both I personally and the school as a whole um, are hugely indebted to everything that she's done for us. So what they don't tell you about becoming a professor is that along with the pay rise and the prestige, it brings on an intellectual midlife crisis. Because the first question they ask you is, what will you be a professor of? Or in other words, what do you profess? Now it's not necessarily surprising that the word professor has its roots in statements of religious faith. After all, universities began as venues for theological learning outside the monasteries. The OED's primary entry of professor comprises senses relating to the declaration of faith, principles, etc. And the first usage of professor in the academic sense is simply an extension of that. 
the profession of beliefs, not as an expression of faith, but of disciplinary authority. As it happens, the word professional has a similar trajectory, from an upholder of religious vow to a member of the upstanding middle classes. And of course, you could say the same thing about vocation, a word today which has expanded in rather contradictory directions. Vocation is a job we do out of love rather than simply to earn money, and vocational as career-oriented study. Both profession and vocation can be traced to an initiatory speech act, a vocation as a form of voicing, and profession as a statement of belief. In this context, it makes sense to think of the inaugural lecture as analogous to the public taking of holy vows. Now, I'm an amateur lexicographer at best, and so we'll not overdo these epistemological musings or continue to bombard you with screenshots from OED online. But this history of professing offers a salutary reminder that underpinning one's academic authority, however reasoned and evidenced, lies an article of faith. Alongside the beliefs one holds about one's area of specialism lies a belief in that area of specialism, a belief that this stuff has value, that there is a meaning here greater than one's own career progression, great though that be. Um, and today, I often wonder what the hell I'm doing professing literary criticism. When I was choosing what to study at university back at the, around the turn of the millennium, the stakes didn't seem particularly high. We were living through the so-called end of history, um, that followed the end of the Cold War, a period characterised, at least in the West, by cheap consumer goods, the promise of endless economic growth, and an apparent liberal democratic consensus. At that point, climate change was not yet out of hand, and digital technologies were primarily experienced as a novel means of accessing information and pirated MP3s. And of course, student fees were not the source of anxiety and lifelong debt that they have become. In such an environment, it seemed easy enough to choose one's degree topic without any considerations either of future or employability or, for that matter, of confront confronting the problems of the world. And so, for reasons of pure intellectual curiosity, I chose to study literature, and in particular, to study poems. Not as a poet, moreover, but as a critic, or as a reader, perhaps. But in a world of climate emergency, a world where we are contending with the disruptions and transformations wrought by these new technologies on everything from the nature of work to our mental well-being to the organisation of societies, studying poems might seem, well, a bit self-indulgent. The world is complex, the challenge is enormous, and academics must surely place their expertise at the service of society. I don't know if there's anyone here who has been attending all the inaugural lectures this year, other than the UEA events team, of course, and my great thanks to them for organising this. Um, but if you are one of those hardy souls, you'll have seen ample evidence of UEA academics facing up to the most pressing questions of the age. My fellow inductees into the professoriate have touched on such topics as threats to data privacy, combating epidemics in mental illness, eradicating global inequalities, achieving net zero. And here I am with a silly pun about tunes. So what then is the article of faith which might justify or at least render illegible such professing? Why spend a, a lifetime reading poems at all? My simple answer, when we study poetry, we attune ourselves to the expressive power of language. We enlarge our linguistic sensorium. Poetry, even within literary studies, can seem something of a minority interest and surely the furthest form from any activist engagement with the world. But if our aim is to attune ourselves towards the power of language, then there is no more effective activity than reading poems closely and intensively. Because poetry is language in its most condensed, but also its most enlarged form. Reading poems, we attune ourselves to the ways in which language makes sense. This vocation of poetry is encapsulated in the famous opening quatrain to William Blake's Auguries of Innocence. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. What poetry does precisely is to release the infinite from within the tiniest nuances of language. We take an individual image or rhyme and unlock in it vast latencies of meaning, multiple senses that head off in multiple directions and awaken modes of thinking and sensing hitherto unavailable. We do not just visualise this world, but we hear the echo of world 
in word and in wild. We hear the word contained in world, and indeed the world that emerges out of the word. We attune our senses to the sense-making power of words. Let me now put a little more pressure on this phrase, language makes sense. As we all know, the word sense pulls in two apparently opposed directions, the sensible, as it were, and the sensorial. Both of these are present in the Latin root, sensus, and many of our colloquial usages of the word sense blend the two. When we say that someone has good sense, we are alluding to their instincts as well as their intellect. When we say that a being is sentient, we endow it not only with sensation, but the ability to build these sensations into cognitions. Sensing is the mode through which we can grasp meanings but that, that by nature are vague or oblique or enigmatic, not a muddled thinking, but a thinking attuned to ambivalence and uncertainty. So when I say that language makes sense, I take this phrase in the most literal way imaginable. Language generates, produces sense, that is both significations and sensations. The phrase tells us not only that words possess sense, but also that language is itself something sensed. We hear words, we see them, Phrases can have emotional as well as intellectual effects on us. In a world where we habitually set up dualities between body and mind, intellect and emotion, the doubleness of sense acts as a healthy corrective. Thinking is not some disembodied, dispassionate process. It is always bound up in sensing, in sensations, just as emotions and physical experience continually engage our thought. Poetry, to my mind, is the most compelling way of unlocking this sense-making power precisely because, more than any other form of language, it engages both senses of sense, because it appeals to the sensible and the sensorial at the same time, not only the significations of words, but their sonic and visual arrangement. When other linguistic forms unlock this same power, they touch on the condition of poetry. But as Blake Lines attests, Poems do not only make sense, but make senses. We see a world and a heaven, not the. There are multiple worlds, multiple heavens waiting to be released. And indeed, the world that I make of this poem, the world that this poem opens up for me, will be different to the world that anyone else in this room will make of this poem. The poem's infinity um, comprises all these possible readings and is reducible to none of them. This is, I think, one of the unsettling things about studying poems, and lots of us in this room either study or teach them, and will no doubt have seen this. The multiplicity of senses that poems open up can be thrilling, but also destabilizing. When people complain that a poem doesn't make sense, what they're often complaining about is, in fact, the opposite. Not an absence of sense, but a surplus. Too much meaning, too many sensory stimuli proliferating in too many directions to be reduced to a unitary sense. By refusing such reductivism, poems invite us to disburden ourselves of such impoverished reading practices, and rather to release ourselves into the open-ended movements of sense, into multiple ways of sensing. To read a poem in this way means embracing what John Keats termed negative capability. That is, being capable in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. With their lack of fixed reference, their refusal to be resolved into any single paraphrase, poems invite us to experience uncertainty as liberating rather than destabilizing. Or better, to recognize that that sensation of being destabilized is itself productive, that if you're too stable, you'll never go anywhere. In these ways, poetry's multiplicity of sense, its constitutive multivalence, stands in stark contrast to the specious forms of certainty that dominate so much of our daily life. It is perhaps one of the reasons that literature in general, and poetry in particular, have been so badly served by the last decade of government education policy, where the openness of poems runs aground against the demands of a so-called knowledge-based curriculum. And of course, we live today the consequences of a public discourse which, um, across from both left and right, routinely proceeds through dogmatic position taking, where everything is presumed to be known in advance. 
poem's thickening and opening of sense frustrates all epistemologies and moralisms of unthinking certainty. More than this, given the increased tendency towards arguments that precede ad hominem, poems remind us of the agency of language that operates outside and beyond its authors, its speakers, its readers, the way that senses are at once embedded in a context and yet irreducible to that context, an agency that endlessly multiplies positionalities and thwarts any easy, simplistic position-taking. This is not to say that a poem's sense-making is a complete free-for-all, that the surplus of senses dissolves into senselessness. The most compelling poems manage to blend an open-ended determinacy with a real precision of language. Take, for example, Anne Carson's Gnosticism I, a poem whose interlacement of its and our senses is at the heart of its sense. It's a strange, beautiful poem about getting stuck in the physicality of words and never quite getting out the other side an experience of disorientation in language, but also of intoxication with language. And just to say the two contemporary-ish poems I'm discussing are two poems that I've habitually taught as the first thing I teach the first years when they, in week one when they arrive um, at LDC. So, um, Heaven's Lips. I dreamed of a page in a book containing the word bird, and I entered bird. Bird grinds on grinds on, thrusting against black, thrusting wings, thrusting again, hard banks slap against it either side, that bird was exhausted. Still, beating, working its way, and below in dark woods, small creatures leap, rip at food with scrawny lips, lips at night. Nothing guiding it, bird beats on, night wetness on it. A lion looks up. Smell of adolescence in these creatures, this ordinary night for them. Astonishment inside me like a separate person, sweat-soaked. How to grip. For some people a bird sings, feathers shine. I just get this, this. On first read, the poem is somewhat disorienting. One can't identify a clear narrative, a clear speaker, or even a clear referential context. Nor is it clear initially what it means to have entered bird. There are lines which don't seem to make grammatical sense. Um, and there are individual words that suggest mutually incompatible meanings. For instance, does still um, mean not moving, or does it mean continuing, in which case the bird is moving? But at the same time, one can sense the eroticism of the poem, the repetition of grinds, thrusting, the wetness and sweat of the dream, and of course the opening, heaven's lips. And one can sense the difference between bird as a referent to the words and bird as a word, as a linguistic token, with physical properties, including its rhyme with the word word. The difference between entering the perspective of the bird in the book and entering the word itself, so that the movement of the bird, grinding, thrusting, beating, comes to stand for the progress of language. One can sense also that the book, with its pages as hard banks, merges with the dark woods that the bird flies through. Maybe there's an allusion here to the production of paper out of wood, and thus a different kind of physicality of words. But at the same time, the dark woods can be read as a metaphor for sleep, with the dream travelling through it as the bird travels through the woods. And one could also note those other physical properties of words, the way that leap and rip, and for that matter, lion and up, can be condensed into that word lip. Um, which then reminds us, of course, that lips are used for eating and for speaking, but of course also for kissing, which would bring us back to the sort of sensuality of the poem. Thus, the poem prepares us not through a linear narrative or clearly defined speaker, but rather through the accumulation of senses and the attunement of our senses for the otherwise enigmatic final sentence, I just get this, this. Deictic words like this and that, um, or pronouns you, he, um, they, etc., um, or um, temporal nouns like now, here, there, these deictics only make sense in a clear referential context, um, this lecture being one example. Um, moreover, by not naming the referent, deictics point to an outside of language, but in Carson's final line, the this points only to itself. 
but to the pure sensuousness of words. Carson's eye is both trapped in language and released into language. This poem is such a powerful one, not just because it presents the pleasures of sensing words rather than decoding them, but also because this is a poem that we can only read by sensing it. That is, by feeling for meanings, attending to the movements of the words, letting the poem's multiple senses coalesce and cohere. In that regard, the poem becomes something like an allegory for the very process of making sense. And what is crucial here is that sense-making is a participative activity. Um, the poem makes sense only as we make sense of the poem, or better, make sense with the poem. The po poems give themselves over to our senses. When we make sense of a poem, we orient ourselves sensibly and sensorially around the poem. We bring the poem to our senses, and in so doing, bring the poem to its senses. From this, I would like to make three further observations, none of which include continually bothering the word sense to, within, um, to the point of senselessness. Um, Firstly, the poem's meanings do not lie behind the poem, but in front of it. There's a tendency to think of a poem's meanings as something inside the poem to be discovered by stripping layers off the poem's surface until eventually we reach its underlying message or originating experience. But, but the, the meanings that I've just been looking at emerge when a poem comes into contact with a reader. They are meanings released by the poem rather than hidden behind them. As readers, we are not seeking to decode the poem to find such hidden meanings, but rather to participate in the process of sense-making, and indeed to actualize all the senses the poem made possible. Obviously, there was more sensing in there than I expected. Um, every reading is both more and less than the poem it reads, more because it opens onto directions only gestured to by the poem, less because by pursuing a particular direction, others are necessarily closed off. Secondly, this means that our primary question when analysing a poem is not what does the poem mean, but what does the poem do? Meaning in poetry is an, not a noun, but a verb. What we analyse is not meaning as reference, but meaning as process, a process of which we are part. This changes the questions we ask of the poem away from authorial intentions towards activities of language, the ways that a particular poem sets language to work, Working in a university with so many creative writers does disabuse you of the cliché of authors as tormented geniuses or rarefied creative intelligences, though obviously some of them are, are geniuses, um, <laughs> and emphasises that the writer's art lies in the practicalities of crafting language. Writing is a product of craft rather than a transparent representation of the author's person. But this also changes the notion of authority. There is, of course, a shared root between author and authority, but when we ask the question, what does the poem do? We are displacing authority away from the poet, not to transfer it to the critic or the reader, but rather to recognize that the primary agency belongs to the poem as it sets language to work. And thirdly, what we are doing when we read poems, and now I come to my title, is that we are attuning ourselves to tunes. Each poem asks us to attune ourselves to its tunes, but together and cumulatively, poems attune us to language's tunes. That is, we are learning to listen to the sense-making power of language as a whole. This isn't specific to poetry. We all know that in daily speech, tone of voice, pitch, tempo, shape what we say and what we understand. What is specific to poetry is the condensation and intensity with, in which these fixtures these features of sense-making are put on display. In particular, through their segmentation and patterning of language, their creation of linkages and emphases that work and against, with and against prose sense. When we attune ourselves to tunes, we do not merely notice modes of meaning and agencies of language that might otherwise have remained inconspicuous. Our attunement to language's tunes transforms the scope of the sayable. For the remainder of this talk, I'd like to look at some small ways in which poems attune up the, sorry. I'd like to look at some small ways in which poems attune us to their and by extension languages tunes. My first example will be one of the most famous lines from what is no doubt the most famous poem in the English language. 
Um, I don't know how well you can see everything other than the main line. I'm mainly interested in that main line for now. Some time too hot, the eye of heaven shines. The line is organised not just around the broader conceit, the similarities and differences between the address C and a summer's day, but also around the specific metaphor of the sun as the eye of heaven. Underpinning the metaphor is its linkage between the sun and sight. The sun gives light without which we couldn't see, but here the sun is itself seeing, an eye which gives sight to all other eyes, both light-giving and sight-giving. The metaphor opens up further resonances. One might imagine the eye has become too hot because it is looking so intently at the beauty of the poem's addressee, for instance, or that if the eye is the mirror of the soul, the sun is the way that heaven communicates to us, the way we see into heaven. And this would then point to the dual reference of heaven as both the sky and paradise. And let's not forget the other time that eyes appear in this sonnet. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long gives this, lives this, and this gives life to thee. Here, immortality is figured as sight, not the sight of an individual, but rather a collective sight whose eyes belong to humanity rather than to a single person. Just as does heaven, the eye comes to connote a kind of eternity. Now, I'm not saying that Shakespeare meant all this. Indeed, several of the directions of sense opened up actually run counter to the poem's argument that the addressee's beauty is more lovely, more temperate, and less transient, crucially, than the summer's day. The point is, the poem releases these possible meanings. Herein lies its great artistry. In this regard, despite their clear differences in style and technique, Shakespeare's sonnet resembles Carston's Gnosticism poem. Even when there is a stable referent, the sense-making still overruns unitary sense. So this is what I mean when I say that meaning lies in front of rather than behind the poem, the, that the agency belongs to the poem rather than either the poet or the reader. Once we think of the poem as generating meanings rather than possessing meaning, Reading becomes a participative, open-ended activity. The poem takes us in directions that neither it nor we would have imagined beforehand. And indeed, the reading becomes more than the poem, or rather, in reading, the poem becomes more than itself. It might seem strange to think of a metaphor as part of language's tunes, but let's look in more depth at how the metaphor is held together. Some time too hot, the eye of heaven shines. The line is structured by an assonance around the diphthong I, which lands on the first, third, and fifth beats of the line, its beginning, middle, and end. This symmetry gives the line a self-enclosed character, turning in on itself, drawing our attention to that central word, the word which lies at the heart of the metaphor, I. But might the assonance of time, I, shine, point to a deeper linkage between the three words? Of course, the phonemic character of any given word is largely arbitrary. But techniques such as rhyme, assonance, alliteration give, motiva give motivation to these arbitrary sounds. Incidentally, this is particularly the case with assonances or rhymes which are not assimilated into a rhyme scheme, as rhyme schemes naturalize some of these echoes into a pattern. So you could say there's greater motivation in an internal rhyme or rhyme in a non-rhyming poem than there is in the fact that day rhymes with may or shade with fade. Interesting though those rhymes themselves are. So the linkage of time, eye, and shine might, could suggest some kind of transience or instability. The eye of the sun only shines on summer's day, that is, sometimes. But the self-enclosed symmetry of the line seems to push back against transience. It is the same at the end as the beginning, rhyming front and back, and as such seems to stand, stand outside the forward progression of the poem. So just as the association of the rhyming words underscores the inevitable passing of time, um, the rhyme would gesture towards a kind of timelessness. And this, of course, is the ultimate claim made by the poem in its final lines, that poetry can bestow eternity on mortal beauty. And indeed, eternal lines to time gives life is again relying on the very same assonance that we were looking at in that line. Time, I, shines. Incidentally, 
it's worth noting that the poem's sound world, that is, its tunes, operates in a very different way to that of imitative sound effects, such as onomatopoeia, or more broadly, what is often called verbal mimesis, where following Alexander Pope's not notorious, but also rather peculiar phrase, the sound must seem an echo of the sense. Um, peculiar, not only because he says seem, i.e. not is, must seem, and also the fact that an echo implies that it comes afterwards, and that, that the sense, in order to have an echo, must itself be sonorous. It's a very kind of fascinating phrase that often gets used in sort of quite a, um, quite a reductive way. Um, but what I want to sort of diverge from Pope here, um, great poet that he is, is that instead of Pope understanding the meaning of poetic sounds as imitating specific and pre-existing significations of words and coming after those significations, the echo is of course always secondary, we are attending to the ways that the sounds generate the poem's senses by shaping and, and enlarging its sense-making activity. Here, as ever, there is no more valuable way of attuning ourselves to a poem than reading it, it aloud, of using our voices as a sounding board for its tunes. As we attune ourselves to the poem's tunes, we open ourselves to new and intensified emotional responses to what language is capable of. We enliven ourselves not only to the sense of tunes, but also to the tunefulness of sense. <coughs> At this point, I'd like to compare this line from Shakespeare's sonnet to a line from a sonnet of a very different sort, from Terence Hayes' sequence of American sonnets for my past and future assassin. And I can see at least one person in this room who was in the class at the time basing this on. The line that I'm going to look at is, I make a, you a box of darkness with a bird in its hut. <clears throat> Firstly, we might hear in I make you an echo of making as the poet's art. The Greek poiesis initially meant making and found an echo in, for instance, the makars of um, medieval Scotland. The doubleness of make here reinforces it. I make you a box can either be a gift or a description of the transformative power of language. I turn you into a box. In Hayes's poem, make seems to echo lock. I lock you in American song, I lock you, I lock you, I make you, and then I make you. Um, and this gives us a, a vision of poetic making as enclosure. I lock you in a sonnet. And whereas this line, what is made is a box, another enclosed space, the sonnet is initially described as part prison, part panic closet, a little room in a house set of flame, and then you, the other enclosed spaces, music box, meat grinder, sleeper hold, trapped. And then you could say shadows, gym, do something similar. Another resonance we can sound out is in the figure of the bird, which alliterates with box and might conjure up associations of the full-throated ease of Keats's nightingale, or alternatively, given the enclosed spaces of the poem, the trope of the caged bird, um, whether in John Webster's We Think Caged Birds Sing When Indeed They Cry, or in Maya Angelou's image of the caged bird that sings of freedom. And at this point, especially thinking of Angelou as an important intertext for the poem, um, we might hear the consonants of make and dark, and the assonance of dark and heart, um, which then offers another illusion Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, a novel which famously excoriates the racial brutality of the colonization of Africa, but does, through, does so with a reliance on the very, very racialized tropes that it aims to decry. And then we might wonder if the bird is in fact not a songbird, but part of Hayes's pun on Jim Crow. You've got, I make you both Jim and Crow here. At which point, pastoral tropes of birdsong with their beautiful catharsis are undercut by the specific bird, the crow, which of course has its own poetic history from Edgar Allan Poe's Raven to Ted Hughes. The sonnet, is, as envisaged by Hayes, um, is, as it were, a container, but also paradoxically a source of freedom. The poem's condensation of language does not just lock sense into a sonnet, but also unlocks its senses to own and endlessly outwards, releasing not just volters, but vaults, charges of poetic energy. The tension and release of poetic making thus serves as an allegory for a broader attempt to birth to beyond stricture, 
Refusing a single reading, the poem resists containment. Its political thinking proceeds through its sensorial plenitude. In each of the poems I've discussed, language makes sense not just through linear progression, but cumulatively, counter-progressively, diagrammatically and paragrammatically. Poems speak forwards and speak back, turn in on themselves and turn outwards. They hold together by containing these tensions, but also by channeling these tensions and releasing them in different directions. Hopefully, my readings have done justice to the extraordinary artfulness of these poems as tightly knit objects. But however tightly knit they are, their sense-making constantly overflows their objecthood, releases energies into the world of its readings. In this way, the condition of the poem is always to be more than it is to live in its afterlives. But to come back to the, quest to the anxiety where I started this talk, in what way does this speak to the most pressing questions of our age? Firstly, I'd like to argue that when we are attuned to the sense-making activities of language, we develop not just an aesthetic appreciation to the tunefulness of sense, but also a critical vigilance to the way that languages can, language can both conceal and reveal, both obfuscate and facilitate. But more than this, it encourages an openness to the sheer plenitude of language, an opening of our linguistic senses. There is a politics here, not a politics of position taking, but rather of the intensification and enlargement of our linguistic sensorium. It is also integral to literature's long-standing vocation to imagine a world lived otherwise, for articulating impossible desires and modes of desiring. By its nature, literature continually plays at the, bounds of the, at the boundaries of the sayable. Perhaps one of the reasons I was drawn to study literature all those years ago is because in the early years of New Labour, which seemed to confirm Thatcher's insistence that there was no alternative, literature offered a world of alternative modes of thinking, sensing, and speaking. Poems invite us to read more intensively, more expansively, to sense more intensively, sense more expansively. Poems mean not through presenting choices of either or, but rather through a logic of both and. They continually demand that we feel more, think more, feel again, think again. In so doing, they enlarge our sense of the sayable. I'm hardly the first person to suggest that the politics of poetry lies less in its content than in its form, and it's worth saying that there is quite clearly political content in some of the poems that I've looked at. The openness and instability which can make poems pretty ineffective as political speech acts are precisely what endow them with political valence. Hayes's poem is indubitably an articulation of a political pr predicament and is indeed driven by a compelling moral vision. And if you haven't read that poem and the full collection, I really recommend it. But as it, com as it complicates its own language, pluralizes its modes of sense-making, it shifts away from a politics of position-taking only and opens onto another politics, one which lies in the enlargement of the sayable. And to this, I will add one final observation. The openness and the participative nature of the poem's sense-making means that each reading is shaped by its own provisionality. This is one more way in which poems ask us to feel more, think more, and think again. To attune ourselves to this open-endedness, to search out complexity, not to resolve it, but rather to track the directions it might take us in, necessitates a certain humility of mind that sits ill with the very idea of disciplinary authority. Instead of professing mastery, I would profess an attunement, or rather an attuned mode of reading. So here is my profession of faith in poetry's enlargement of the sensorium of language. Perhaps studying poetry does not speak directly to the world's most urgent questions, but perhaps it is precisely in its indirection, or rather its multidirectionality, that, this, that is the source of its value right now. Opening up in so many directions, asking us to feel more, think more, think again. Thank you. much David I think that we'll all agree that well for those of us who don't already know this for those of you who may be tuning in and this is your first time hearing David 
profess not to profess, that his brilliance is really rooted in a magical combination of curiosity, care, and commitment. And you know, his, this comes through both in his intellectual work, which he shared with us tonight, but also in his commitment to, to students and to education. So it's such a pleasure to congratulate you on your inaugural and to have you as a professorial colleague in the school. So can we just thank David once more? <laughs> My thanks also go to David's family, his friends, his colleagues, his students who are here with us tonight in person, but also who've joined us online. It means everything for us to think in community. Everything that David has just said wouldn't happen in isolation. It matters to us to have you here, so thank you so much for taking the time tonight. David began by saying that his inaugural followed those on climate crisis, on global inequalities. And obviously, the evidence base brought forward by our colleagues here in sciences and social sciences is really important for changing the world. But it seems to me, without expanding the scope of the sayable, without thinking more, saying more, feeling more, doing that all over again, those challenges actually stand a pretty hard chance of being met. So I do feel really strongly that it's very fitting that we ended with the power of poetry. And also, perhaps it's notable that this is widely recognized. During the pandemic, the sales of poetry went up hugely. So perhaps poetry is genuinely a resource for us in times of crisis. So I think it's really fitting, and I you know, feel that we're immensely privileged as a university to have David's insights on the power of poetry alongside the, our colleagues who've been talking about climate change and global injustice. I'm now going to open up the floor for questions, but also we're going to take some questions online. So if you have joined us virtually, please do uh, put questions into the chat uh, or comments. And I think we've got uh, a roving mic with us and somebody monitoring the online as well. So I'm going to open up the floor. I've got a question there from Joe. Um, thanks very much, David. That was great. Um, and a real fine example of close reading there. Um, at the end, I felt like you were kind of magnifying out from talking about just poetry to talking about literature. And I wondered what the... I don't want to you know, be that guy who asks a question which is essentially, why aren't you talking about something different? But... I wonder where the novel as a form comes into this idea of the poem is doing this specific thing, because there's an account of the novel that would be, it's the most open form, that everything is possible in a novel, it can be about anything, but then there's also an account of the novel which would say that it is the form which acts upon the social world, it's, a, it's acting transitively, it's an intervention into the social world, which you don't normally hear that kind of account about poetry, but I think you sort of quite elegantly made that about the political um, vibrance, I suppose, about poetry. So I wonder, it, you know, am I just basically taking you in a direction you don't want to go in, or can you maybe talk a little bit more about that kind of magnification out at the end from talking about poetry to talking about literature more broadly? Um, thanks, Joe. So at one point, I slightly, <clears throat> perhaps provocatively, said that if other literary forms achieve this, they touch on the condition of poetry. And um, with all due respect to my colleagues here who work on other literary forms, or work in other literary forms, um, I, if you were to try and read a novel where you had to spend that much time on every single sentence, then you wouldn't get to the end of the novel in a thousand years. Um, and I think that one of the intensifications that happens specifically in short form lyric poetry, because of that kind of condensation, because of that sort of time, 
that that medium actually renders certain forms of attention possible that n just are not going to be form honoured. The other thing that's happening here is a departure from narrative. And obviously, there are, in there are novels that work with and against narrative in lots of ways, and there are novels that are spectacularly artful. And as you say, which sort of think through the bounds of the sayable, often through narrative means, through dramatic means, etc. But I guess what I'm interested in here is specifically the texture of sentences. And without wanting to say there's Finnegan's Wake as the example, um, I'd kind of tend to say that for the particular intensification and ambivalence of language, that yes, novels are multivalent, obviously, and, and often brilliantly, but if every single sentence were multivalent, you could never read a novel. Um, whereas, whereas with this kind of poetry, and I guess then I should sort of specify that there are other forms of poetry sort of which don't necessarily work at this level of shortness and intensity, um, dramatic poems, ec epic poems, but also verse essays and epistles and so on, which, which then do e extraordinary things nevertheless. But I think the other thing that I just point to that you have in poetry, and including in prose poetry, is you have the segmentation of language. Um, and that that allows for a particular kind of, sort of, as it were, um, I think I said paragrammatic um, operation of meaning. And yes, you get rhythmic segmentation in some novels, but it is not of the same kind of programmatic level as segmentation is for, for poetic writing. And I'm, you're sitting next to Jeremy, who knows this a lot better than I do, but segmentation isn't just a question of line breaks. Segmentation is also a crucial um, poetic resource for prose poets. And, but I think that segmentation is probably what I'm going to hide behind, other than shortness. Thank you. Are there other questions in the room? Tiffany. <coughs> I, think the, I think the mic will come to you. I think it's for the online audience we need the mic. There's one heading your way. Thank you. Thanks so much, David, for professing poetry. Um, and um, I was thinking that the, the only time I've ever heard anyone talk about professing poetry before is Charles Bernstein, and I think it's the attack of the difficult poems or something, where he says, and I'm going to paraphrase probably really badly, but, but he's professing difficult poetry. And, and when Alison mentioned the sales of poetry um, going up over lockdown, I have a hunch that a lot of that was... Um, perhaps insta-poetry or a different kind from the kind we tend to, to study. Um, and I suppose I just wondered, you know, uh, can you profess that too? What, what would you say? Because I get asked that a lot. What about insta-poets? <laughs> um, so you, you called me out on the fact that I nicked this entire conceit from Charles Bernstein. <laughs> so uh, thanks. Um, you did it much better. Ch Charles Bernstein's professing as a poet. I'm professing as a reader. Um, I don't want to just say give me a poem by Rupi Kaur and I'll sort of close read the fuck out of it though I'll, I'll do my best um, but that also that once we start to look we can actually start to see those forms of linkage and segmentation and um, and that as it were reading things in this way kind of introduces difficulty even into language that might seem transparent you know which is why you get so much you know, in sort of the difficult poetry world, you also get lots of found materials where actually the latent kind of complexity and multivalence is getting, is sort of getting shown up, that it's always there. And so that's one of the, that's one of the things about sort of focusing on the professing of the reading, the reading of poetry, the reading as poetry. And I think that, that that's a lot where the complicating things happen. I, I do think it's true that poems attune us to that, but they, once they attune us to that, they attune us to that in all language. Um, especially the kinds of poems which really do intensively condense language. Um, it's a false etymology. I've tried to stick to real etymologies, but rather in, in this, though I don't know how successfully. But um, Ezra Pound famously um, said 
um, dichten, which is the German verb um, to poetize, equals condensare, that, that it is true that in German, um, dichten means to condense and dichten means to poetize. The two words have no etymological relation whatsoever, as, as I understand it. But nevertheless, Pound saw that and thought, well, isn't this helpful? We can think of the primary work that poetry does on language is one of condensing. This kind of comes back to my answer to Joe. So you always work out the answer to the first question halfway through the second question. Um, but the, that condensation of language is then an attunement that we have to language that means that we're able to see that, con that the same operations of language happening even in less condensed language. So I do, I do think that the kind of attentiveness or attunement is still going to be there even though I'm going to take Terence Hayes over Insta Poets every time. Just going to check in to see if we have any questions. No questions online at the moment. So those of you joining us online, if you have your questions, please do put them into the chat. Are there any more? I can see two, one, one at the front here and then one at the back. So maybe we can get the mics either way. I'll just get one. going up first, right? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for such a fascinating close reading. Um, I guess I was really interested by, obviously, this idea of the kind of tune that's haunting all of these lyric poets and poems, and obviously also the idea of um, the way that the kind of sonic quality of words is trying to potentially mimic a tune and the way that you kind of bring out those patterns. Um, do you think, and sorry if you kind of don't think about this necessarily, but do you think that um, the kind of sonic patterns in lyric poems, like the ones you looked at, are blurred in the context of music or are they kind of brought out further when they're, when they're accompanied by music? Um, so my general thought on this is that um, there's kind of a moment where lyric poetry ceases predominantly to be sung and becomes predominantly read. I'm not going to give a date to it. I'm not good at that kind of history. But that that, that movement happens. And when it happens, the words need to provide their own music. Because in a way... The music of poetry relies on reading. It relies on silence. And that's partly because it, re it relies on multiple interpretations, multiple ways of scanning something, multiple ways of hearing something, um, that every single voicing closes off other voicings. So as it were, poetry lives in subvocalization rather than in, um, rather than in vocalization. Um, obviously, there are some amazing settings of, um, of words to music. Um, the, you know, throughout, I mean, just to give like particular examples, say sort of, you know, Schubert settings of um, Lieder or, um, or say the settings of um, Mallarmé by Debussy or what have you. Um, so that, that, is, that is amazing and that draws different things out and but often they then go kind of at cross purposes of the sense and the sense in that kind of in, enlarged sort of double sense um, one of the things that making music out of language is kind of different from setting language to music and it's a really important distinction even though powerful settings of, of poems do you kind of see a, an extension of that sort of making music out of language and then see what happens when you take that into a completely different register? Because obviously music has so many more um, resources than just a spoken human voice. Um, I'm not sure that that answers your question, but it'll have to do. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, again, thank you very much for the lecture. And I guess I'm coming at this from a student's perspe uh, perspective, but long story short, close reading can be very frustrating. So um, what techniques would you sort of like give out? And what tips do you have for like starting to read with poetry rather than against it? Um, patience is probably, I, the, I think one of the, One of the things that I cut out of this at an early stage, because I didn't want to go there, was a rant about the way that poetry gets taught before students get to university. I'm not going to do that entire rant now because there's wine outside and it's almost half past. Um, but the difficulty of poetry is often that it first gets taught as a comprehension exercise. You're expected that every single word will be able to be reducible to a particular thing. And that if you don't understand it, it's because there is a thing there that you don't have, which means you can't understand it. But, so it's actually a change of attitude. So that uncertainty and plurality and ambivalence and opaqueness are exciting rather than um, destabilizing. Or alternatively, that desta being destabilized or disoriented is productive rather than scary. And I think it's very, very difficult if for seven years, if not more, of studying poetry, you're being told that you need to reach a particular thing, you need to show particular bits of knowledge, then to turn up and have somebody say, the thing is, none of us know anything. This can mean a million things and let's just see where it takes us. The problem is that that is right. The, <laughs> the, it is that what, what we ask people, when people study poems, they're learning to live with uncertainty and to enjoy uncertainty. And we're not a society that is tolerant of uncertainty, I don't think. And whilst at the same time, in lots of ways, life is incredibly uncertain. There's um, precarious, or, I mean, precarity wasn't even a word 10 years ago. Um, that, that there are these kind of fundamental changes brought on, so, on our society, which means that everybody searches for certainty, understandably, but at the same time, what poetry teaches us is actually to live with and take pleasure in uncertainty. So I don't think that what you need is, um, is a kind of a vocabulary of concepts or what have you, that if you kind of were able to sort of identify the difference between an anapest, a dactyl, and an amphibrach, that that would solve everything. Um, well, I absolutely wanted to avoid, and the other rant I didn't do was about metrical terminology. Um, <laughs> but I, I could do that rant now. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna quickly say about metrical terminology that it basically <laughs> was introduced into, it, English poetic discourse predominantly um, in a context of educational manuals for public schools in the late 19th century. And that idea of mastery that you get by firstly using Greek language that was largely used to discuss Latin poems for two languages that have no, very little phonological relation to the way that stress patterns work in English that then gets imposed on it. Using Latin and using Greek for meter is a very good way of basically saying if you don't have a public school education then this is not for you um i don't have a public school education i've got a chip on my shoulder um <laughs> but that um but those kind of performances of mastery are then obviously part of a broader ideological project that's going on in the late 19th century which is linked to amongst other things obviously imperialism so I think there is genuinely, and I know it's maybe a bit of a stretch, there is genu genuinely a, um, a continuity between the discourse on, on poetry that comes out of the kind of classical education that you get in late 19th century public schools and, um, a, and basically coloniality um, in, a, in an Anglophone context. Um, oh, rant over. Back to living. But so basically, what happens when we think without mastery? What happens when we actually think of uncertainty as something to take pleasure in and something where instead of trying to shut down meaning and fix meaning, 
we're thinking what are the different directions this takes us in. It's, a, it's not, a, you don't need more concepts. Like I use the word assonance, I think, I'm, and I use the word rhyme, and I think I use the word alliteration. I didn't use any other terminology in this. You don't need terminology to describe the effects that the music of language has on you. What you need is just attunement, is to kind of be receptive to it and not be scared of difficulty and not be scared of uncertainty and not feel that your job intellectually is to, is to identify a single thing. But that attitudinal change after all of the schooling that you get is exceptionally difficult. It's one of the things that is sucking the life out of literary studies um, across the across the country. God, that was a downer to end on, wasn't it? I think it was a powerful note of democratisation, actually. Uh, so thank you so much for that. OK, everybody, I think, uh, finally just turns to us now. Thank you all for those questions and an opportunity to hear David, actually perhaps in a little bit more of his spirited uh, professing <coughs> mode um, that he's held back on before tonight. So that, that's been wonderful. But it is now time to... Uh, move out of the room towards a further celebration in the foyer with a little bit of a, a toast uh, or materials for a toast anyway. And um, I'm just going to ask you all again, uh, both online, if you want to uh, give a, an online clap, and those of you in the room, please to thank David Watson. <laughs>